evidence implicating the former president in certain financial crimes during their trip. Incidentally, that information, too, is missing from Mr. Durham's final pages. When he could not give Donald Trump evidence of a deep state conspiracy, Mr. Durham gave him the next best thing, a public narrative with Hillary Clinton as the victim, villain. Over the ensuing years, Mr. Durham constructed a flimsy story built on shaky inferences and dog whistles to far-right conspiracy theorists. Although he lost both times, he took a case to trial. By prolonging his investigation, Durham was able to keep Donald Trump's talking points in the news long after Trump left office. With a loose approach to DOJ norms, protecting the reputation of the agency, and a cavalier disregard for the privacy and reputational rights of others, Mr. Durham's investigation operated as headline generator for MAGA Republicans. Less than half a year into his four-year investigation, Mr. Durham publicly disputed Inspector General Horowitz's conclusion that the FBI was warranted in opening a full investigation in violation of DOJ rules protecting investigations from appearances of political bias. Mr. Durham similarly flouted guidelines designed to protect third parties from reputational injury when he used his two indictments to accuse the Clinton campaign of a vast conspiracy to tie Trump to Russia. But at the end of the day, Mr. Durham never found what he was looking for. He cannot dispute a single conclusion in the Mueller report. He cannot prove a magnificent deep state conspiracy. And he cannot say that the FBI investigation into the Trump campaign's many ties to Russia never should have happened. And again, I can see why this would be disappointing to some. But instead of owning up to his failure, the Durham report doubles down on theories that lost spectacularly before two unanimous juries. The report also references classified material that has been called likely disinformation to lay out a series of accusations against the former president's perceived enemies. By presenting his so-called findings in this way, swiping a Republican boogeyman and hiding an inconvenient truce in footnotes, the Durham report gives Donald Trump one last talking point. It did not have to be this way. It may be hard to remember, but at the outset of the Durham investigation, Mr. Durham was a well-respected career prosecutor with a solid reputation. The Attorney General is supposed to appoint a special counsel to prevent the appearance of politicization in a criminal investigation. Mr. Durham could well have lived up to that expectation. Instead, what we got was a political exercise that operated with ethical ambiguity and existed to perpetuate Donald Trump's unfounded claims. The investigation failed in its political objectives, but did real damage to a department that is still recovering from the excesses of the Trump administration. And despite Mr. Durham's best efforts, a reckoning is well underway. Do not be misled. Former President Donald Trump is not a victim. He did this to himself. For all of its flaws, the Durham report does not show that anyone else is responsible for the president's legal woes, past, present, or future. Anyone who tells you otherwise is simply making it up. I thank the chairman, and I yield back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Today's witness is the Honorable John Durham. Mr. Durham was appointed as a special counsel in 2020 to investigate intelligence activities investigations arising out of the 2016 presidential campaigns. He is a career prosecutor, having served as a U.S. attorney for the District of Connecticut and in various other roles with that office since 1989. Prior to that, he served with the Department of Justice, the Boston Strike Force on organized crime, and in various state-level prosecutors' offices. We welcome our witness uh, and thank him for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand, Mr. Durham? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief so help you God? That the record shows that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may, you may be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes, but we'll give you a little extra time if you need it. Mr. Durham, you may begin. Hit your mic there, Mr. Durham, and just, just keep it on if you can throughout the, throughout the day. Oh, is it on? Yep, it's on now. Thank you. And again, uh, good morning, um, <laughs> Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of uh, this committee. As the committee knows, on May 13th, 2019, Attorney General Barr directed me to conduct a preliminary review into certain matters related to federal investigations concerning the 2016 presidential election campaigns. That review subsequently um, developed into several criminal investigations and gave rise to my subsequent appointment as special counsel in these matters. Many of the most significant issues documented in the report that we have written, including those relating to lack of investigative uh, discipline, failure to take logistical and logical investigative steps, and bias are re uh, relevant to important national security interests that this committee and the American people are concerned about. If repeated and left unaddressed, these issues could result in significant national security risks and further erode the public's faith and confidence in our justice system. As we said in the report, um, our findings were sobering. I can tell you, having spent 40 years plus as a federal prosecutor, they were particularly sobering to me. A number of my colleagues who have uh, spent decades in the FBI themselves, they were sobering. While I'm encouraged by some of the reforms that have been implemented by the FBI, the problems identified in this report, anybody who actually reads the report and the details of the report, the documented portions of the report, I think uh, would find that um, the problems identified in the report are not susceptible to overnight fixes. As we said in the report, they cannot be addressed solely by enhancing training or additional policy requirements. Rather, what is required is accountability, both in terms of the standards to which our law enforcement personnel uh, hold themselves and in the consequences they face for violation of laws and policies of relevance. I'm here to answer your questions. I appreciate the opportunity to. I'll answer them to the best of my ability, and I hope to be of service to your oversight function. As I'm sure you know, the Department of Justice um, has issued some guidelines as to what I'm authorized to discuss and those things that I'm not authorized to discuss. In this regard, uh, accordingly, I'll refer principally to the report. I do want to emphasize a few points at the outset, however. 
First, I want to emphasize in the strongest terms possible that my colleagues and I carried out our work in good faith, with integrity, and in the spirit of following the facts wherever they lead, without fear or favor. At no time and in no sense did we act with a purpose to further partisan political ends, to the extent that somebody suggests otherwise, that's simply untrue and offensive. Second, the findings set forth in this report are serious and deserve attention from the American public and its representatives. Let me just briefly highlight a few of those. For one, we found troubling violations of law and policy in the conduct of highly consequential investigations directed at members of a presidential campaign and ultimately a presidential administration. To me, it matters not whether it was a Republican campaign or a Democrat campaign, it was a presidential campaign. Our team comprised dedicated and experienced prosecutors and law enforcement agents who worked day in and day out through the entire um, COVID epidemic in the office trying to interview people, all in an effort to try to get to those facts and the ground truth. Uh, that such a group of people made these findings, experienced FBI agents, experienced prosecutors, not people by and large from Washington, but from other parts of the country. The fact that these people made these findings, as reflected in the report, um, is of concern um, and should be of concern to any American who cares about our civil liberties, the rule of law, and the just and proportionate application of the law to all of us. Whether we're friends or we're foes, the law ought to apply to everybody in the same way. During our investigation, we charged a former FBI agent who pleaded guilty to the felony offense of altering and fabricating a portion of a document used to obtain a court order a FISA order of a surveillance of the United States citizen, which in our view is a significant problem. Several of the relevant FISA applications at issue um, in the Crossfire investigation omitted references to what was clearly relevant and highly exculpatory information that should have been disclosed to the FISA court. Multiple FBI personnel who signed or assisted in preparing renewal applications for that same FISA warrant acknowledged that they did not believe that the target, Mr. Page, was a threat to national security, much less a knowing agent of a foreign power, which is what the law requires. It appears from our investigation that the FBI leadership dismiss those concerns. Another aspect of our findings concerned the FBI's failure to sufficiently scrutinize information it received or to apply the same standards to allegations it received about the Clinton and Trump campaigns. As our report details, the FBI was uh, too willing to accept and use politically funded and uncorroborated uh, opposition research such as the Steele dossier. The FBI relied on the dossier and FISA applications knowing that it was uh, likely um, material originating from a political campaign, a political opponent. It did so even after the President of the United States, the FBI and CIA directors and others received briefings about intelligence suggesting that there was a Clinton campaign plan underway to stir up a scandal tying Trump to Russia. The accuracy of the intelligence was uncertain at the time, but the FBI failed to analyze or even assess the implications of the intelligence in any meaningful way. When the FBI learned that the primary source of information for the Steele dossier, which was basically the guts of the narrative about there being a well-coordinated um, uh, conspiracy involving Trump and the Russians, when they learned that uh, Danchenko was the um, a primary subsource uh, for those reports is at the time when the FBI already knew that Denchenko himself had previously been the suspect of an FBI espionage investigation. He was suspected of being a Russian asset. Um, and nonetheless, they signed him up as a paid informant without further investigation of that espionage concern to say nothing of resolving that espionage matter before using Denchenko and Denchenko's information. And when the FBI and Special Agent Mueller's office learned that Steele's primary subsource likely had gathered important portions of the dossier information, uh, during travels to Russia with uh, one Charles Dolan, it inexplicably decided not to interview Dolan uh, or investigate his activities. Finally, I would like to add that although our work exposed uh, deep concerns, um, concerning facts about the conduct of these investigations, our report should not be read to suggest in any way that Russian election interference was not a significant threat. It was. <laughs> Nor should it be read to suggest that the investigation, um, the investigative authorities at issue uh, no longer serve important law enforcement and national security interests. They do. Rather, responsibility for the failures and transgressions that occurred here rest with the people who committed them or allowed them to occur. Again, to my mind, the issues raised in the report deserve close attention from the American people and their elected representatives here in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Durham. Uh, the, we will now proceed under the five-minute uh, rule for questions. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Durham, for being here today. This is much anticipated. We have lots of questions for you. I'll try to set the table here at the outset uh, from 20,000 feet. The American people rely on the FBI to abide by its guiding principles, and you know what those are, fidelity, bravery, and integrity. And we rely upon them to uphold the Constitution and protect the American people. Americans deserve and expect from our premier law enforcement agency to apply justice blindly, and that is without political bias or ulterior motives. However, your report now famously states, and here's a big quote, based on the review of Crossfire Hurricane and related intelligence activities, you concluded that the DOJ and FBI failed to uphold their important mission of strict fidelity to the law. There's no, way, another, no other way to put this. The report illustrates egregious actions on behalf of the FBI that have further eroded faith in our institutions. Mr. Durbin, your report, and again here today, you said that your findings and conclusions are sobering. Could you unpack a little bit more what that means? Why do you say sobering? Well, let me, let me um, give you some real life um, views on that. I have had um, any number of FBI agents um, who I've worked with over the years, some have retired, some are still in place, who have come to me and apologized for the manner in which uh, that investigation was undertaken. I take that seriously. These are good, hardworking majority of people in the FBI decent human beings who swear to, uh, under their oaths to uh, abide by the law and, and the like. And uh, I think that that uh, typifies, exemplifies of, uh, the, of the concern here. Um, 
there, is, there were investigative activities undertaken or not undertaken here, uh, which raised real concerns about whether or not the law was followed, the policies in place, the FBI were followed. Um, you wrote in your report, quote, based on the evidence gathered in the multiple exhaustive and costly federal investigations of these matters, including the instant investigation, neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion in their holdings at the commencement of the crossfire investigation. To date, has any evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia ever been uncovered? I mean, there is, there is information, obviously, in the um, report that was prepared by Director Mueller uh, and whatnot, but as uh, to collusion or conspiracy, I'm not aware of any. And, and, when, and, and let me stop you. When the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane, that's the issue at hand, it did not have any information that anyone in the Trump campaign had ever been in contact with Russian intelligence officials. Isn't that right? As we wrote in, as we wrote in the, um, uh, the report, we talked to the director of the CIA, the deputy director of the CIA, the director of NSA, um, uh, and people within the uh, FBI, and there was no such information that they had in their holdings at the time they opened Crossfire Hurricane. And, and you uh, detail, I'm going to go quickly here, I run out of time. You, you, and you, you detail how FBI personnel working on FISA applications uh, violated protocols. They were cavalier at best, as you said in your own words, towards accuracy and completeness. Um, senior FBI personnel displayed a serious lack of analytical rigor uh, towards information that they received, especially information received from politically affiliated persons or entities. And you said, quote, a significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded by Trump's political opponents were relied upon here. Among the most alarm alarming things that you referred to in the report is the impact of confirmation bias. And you said in your report at page 303, that's defined as, or it stands for, the general proposition that there is a common human tendency, mostly unintentional, for people to accept information and evidence that is consistent with what they believe to be true. But sir, here, this wasn't innocent, unintentional, unintentional human tendency, was it? It was overt political bias, was it not? Peter Strzok, for example. There are some in individuals uh, who clearly expressed um, a personal bias. Um, it's difficult to get into somebody else's head to see whether they knew it. Unless we have their emails, right? And he had, Peter Strzok, for example, pronounced host he had pronounced hostile feelings towards President Trump. Everybody knows that. Everybody in the country knows it. So he was in charge of this. He was the direct, direct, deputy assistant director of counterintelligence, officially opened the investigation at the direction of FBI, deputy FBI director Andrew McCabe. He said horrible things about President Trump and all of his supporters, by the way. How can we say he did not have political bias? Yeah, I know that uh, it clearly re reflects a personal bias that, that he had. I'll leave it to others and the facts that are set out in the, um, in the reports, whether that's political bias, personal bias, but there's clearly bias. What we know now is the FBI and the DOJ have been turned into activated political weapons against citizens and even a former president because of their op opposing viewpoints, sir. Um, they failed to follow protocols in 2016, and you suggested new protocols may somehow be affixed to this. How can the American people have confidence that if they didn't follow, follow protocols in 2016 that they will do protocols? And I think that's why um, I said that in the opening remarks, you know, this is not an easy fix. I mean, it's going to take time uh, to rebuild the public's confidence in the institution. The changes of the forms they have made are certainly changes that are going to guard to some extent against the repeat of what happened across our hurricane. I'm out of time, yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Mr. Durham. Can you pull that microphone real close so everyone gets, can hear what you say? We appreciate that. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Durham, your report reads like a defense of the Trump campaign and an attack on Hillary Clinton because that's exactly what it is. Donald Trump wanted you to investigate the investigators to show the deep state conspiracy, but you never found one. Instead, you gave him and his MAGA Republicans the next best thing, someone else to blame for Donald Trump's problems. That's why you're here today, because the chairman and his colleagues need someone, anyone, to deflect from the mounting evidence of Trump's misconduct. Let me remind you that Donald Trump was federally indicted on 37 counts for mishandling classified information. 37 counts. That's why you're here today, not because of anything that happened in 2016. Mr. Durham, your investigation cost more than $6.5 million, involved the work of dozens of FBI employees and federal prosecutors, some of whom resigned in protest and took roughly four years to complete. Is that correct? No. It's not correct. No, I mean, there were multiple did, parts of that. Did it take four years to complete? Correct. Okay. And with all these resources and all these people you, you were sent to help you investigate the investigators, you only filed three criminal cases. You only brought two cases to trial, correct? Correct. And you lost all the cases you brought to trial, correct? Correct. In fact, two juries acquitted your defendants on all charges. And the one conviction that you obtained, the defendant pleaded guilty to a single count that never went to trial, correct? Correct. I will note that in that case, the primary investigative steps were all completed by Inspector General Horowitz. Perhaps you were better when it came to your report. From my reading, your report did not make any specific concrete recommendations to improve DOJ or FBI policies or procedures. In fact, your report repeatedly references the recommendations made by Inspector General Horowitz, almost all of which DOJ and FBI have already implemented. Again, your investigation lasted four years. Four years and untold sums of money, and you still obtained only one conviction. You did produce a 300-page report, though, and that's given my Republican counterparts plenty of material to spin. Mr. Durham, George Papadopoulos was a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign in spring 2016. Isn't that right? Correct. And in May 2016, he told an Australian diplomat that the Trump team had received some kind of suggestion from Russia that it could assist this process with the anonymous release of information during the campaign that would be damaging to Secretary Clinton. This is a fact that came out during the Mueller investigation, and your investigation found nothing to dispute this fact, correct? There's more detail to that in the report. Did you find anything to dispute this report, to dispute this fact? No. Okay. On page 50 of your report, you wrote that, you, you wrote that on July 28, 2016, FBI headquarters received the Australian information that formed the basis for the opening of Crossfire Hurricane, correct? Correct. So this fantasy that some MAGA Republicans have created, where the investigation was started for any reason other than a Trump campaign operative bragging to Australian intelligence assets about Russian dirt that would damage Hillary Clinton is not true. And when the FBI received that information, according to your report, it had not just the predication to investigate, there was no question, you wrote, that the FBI had an affirmative obligation to closely examine the Australian information. Isn't that right? The FBI had an obligation to examine That's correct. 
So the origin of the investigation was not the Steele dossier. It was not Alpha Bank. It was a Trump aide's loose lips about his campaign's advanced view into a hack that had a profound effect on the 2016 election. That information supplied by the Australian government gave the FBI predication to begin an investigation. I'd like to discuss one more false conclusion about your report that's made its way into the MAGA Republican talking points. Some of my colleagues across the aisle have started calling this the, quote, Russia hoax. It's the theory that Russia did not actually interfere in the 2016 presidential election. That is patently false. In 2017, during the Trump administration, the Director of National Intelligence declassified a report on Russian activity in the 2016 election. You're aware of this report, correct? Correct. And in this report, the intelligence community found that, quote, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. Russia's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm her electability and potential presidency. We further assess Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump, close quote. You did not dispute that Trump ordered an influence campaign to influence the 2016 election in your report, did you? As I said, there was a yes or no? threat. No, okay. Special Counsel Mueller indicted 12 Russian intelligence officers in July 2018, isn't that right? Correct. The 12 intelligence officers were indicted for attacking the Clinton campaign. On page 55 of your report, you acknowledge that at a press conference in 2016, Donald Trump on camera said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Is that correct? That's correct. And two years later, they'll sink the summit. Trump told the press that he believed Russian President Putin over his own intelligence officials when he told him Russia did not interfere during the 2016 election uh, season. I see my time has expired. I yield back. The witness can respond if he chooses to. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Fry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today to provide transparency, finally, to the American people. Seven years ago, the FBI launched Crossfire Hurricane, the left brazen attempt to keep Donald Trump out of the White House. This federal investigation, funded by the Hillary Clinton campaign, caused Americans to believe that then-candidate Trump was colluding with Russia in order to win the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Durham has spent four years investigating this, 480 witnesses, six million pages of documents, 190 subpoenas, and executing seven search warrants. Less than a month ago, he completed this report um, that instigated a baseless investigation and launched a partisan attack on President Trump, despite having no true justification to do this. That was the FBI. Within three days of receiving the information from a diplomat in Australia, the FBI opened a full-fledged investigation into the Trump campaign. So, Mr. Durham, let's get into this. The FBI opened up Crossfire Hurricane without speaking to the people who provided the initial information. Is that true? That's correct. The FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane on a Sunday, only three days after reviewing that information. Is that correct? That's correct. So just think about that for a moment. An investigation, a full investigation to a presidential campaign over a weekend. Mr. Durham, the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane without interviewing any of the essential witnesses. Is that true? That's true. And the FBI also opened up Crossfire Hurricane without using any of the standard analytical tools typically employed to evaluate that evidence. Is that true? That's true. So think about that. The FBI never talked to the people who gave them the intelligence information. They never examined their own witnesses. They never interviewed the witnesses. They never corroborated the dossier. Mr. Durham, if the FBI had done these things, if they had done their homework, would it have found that its own Russian experts had no information about President Trump being involved with Russian leadership or Russian intelligence officials? Yes. So then, was there adequate predication?